Zamir Network and your translators are Sebalis and WMCC and in times of war communication is very important and uh, to communicate is a public duty and how that worked in the Yugoslav wars in the 1990s that is what you are next speakers will tell you about in depth please give a nice round of applause to Vam, Rina and Padlun So first, I want to make clear that I'm not a German, so I'll do my best um, to take away my Netherlands accent and not be too serious. I was a little surprised when I moved into this room, and so I kind of imagined a classroom with like 20 people that I could talk about the old days with some people, and then it turned out to be in this enormous room here. So I'm Vam, um, Dutch, I just turned 61, hopefully you can't see that uh, from on my, uh, my appearance. No. <laughs> and somehow in, in the 70s, the mid-70s, mid like many of my people uh, in my, my years, I was very much an anti-computer freak, an anti-computer person. Computers were the kind of thing that ruled the world, that, contr that controlled the world, that checked on the world, and I was totally against him. And my uncle in the Netherlands was defense minister and thought that I needed to do military service in the military and I had completely other ideas about it and so I told him I wasn't going to do it and he had and I had, had no other reaction uh, other than throwing me in jail and so I read a lot about computers back back in those days in those two years and thought that was a pretty inter interesting um, topic and so and so in, in, in 90, 79, I did my doctoral thesis on, in sociology on imagine that uh, computers are getting small, written on a, a, a fox, a big supercomputer that the atomic center of the University of Nether Netherlands needed to, to, to cut short summary we had this kind of devices my professor and i we kind of expected these my professor and i in 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 2070 2080 so you have to imagine there was a there was a day in which they didn't exist there were no phones no no smartphones or no laptops in the 80s, in the 80s, back in the 80s, in the 80s I was active in an organization called European Youth Forest Action of the World, one of the first um, of these networks that was act active in East and West Europe and we pretty quickly noticed it was very difficult to communicate with each other over telephone and so if you call R Russia or Prague, or stuff like that, it took hours. In our offices in the Netherlands, we had a special person who didn't have any, do anything else all night except for calling Russia in the hopes that we would be able to get through. A, a, a pencil to help you call, make phone calls, and you couldn't repeat numbers by tapping, you, ha you had to sort of twist around with your fingers. Do you know Wählscheiben? Rotary dials? You obviously don't. <laughs> And so somehow in my studies, I learned something like dat data communications. And so I was able to let one computer talk to the other, communicate with each other. And if you knew the, re the proper name of the computer and used it right, you did the right commanders with this friggin editor with all these save and stuff and memorize them. I don't know, is this Vim or something? You could talk, you could talk to computers. And so in the mid 80s, there is a invention called the fax machine. Have you heard of that, anyone? Does, is that still a thing? 
Well, this is a device that claims to not be a computer and not talk to other computers. That's why people were less afraid of them. And so, so for the people that want to have things technically, it's like a scanner, printer, and a motor all connected up together. So you can scan a piece of paper, and then it comes out and the printer on the other side. And you could communicate that way. And you could do that quite quick. You could very quickly explain to people how that worked. And somehow, a big Japanese company, I convinced this big Japanese company to send me a large number of, te of phones, uh, uh, fax machines. I just ordered them and thought, we'll see what happens when they arrive. The worst thing that can happen is, it, is that they throw me in jail, and I've already done that uh, two years there, and I did my doctor there. So, you know. <laughs> By the way, probably one of the best places you can do your studies, in jail. No distractions at all. Lots of time. And, you know, if you know why you're in jail... Oh, for those that do PhDs, um, actually that is not true. Uh, it's doing a PhD involves getting the rest of your life sorted out as well, because that is something you need to learn there too. So because then with the rest of your life you can't deal later if you're in prison. Well, there was a vegetarian restaurant in Utrecht that brought us food every day because they, that someone thought, uh, my uncle thought his nephew shouldn't uh, starve. And, uh, so uh, at least I brought, got this company to get 25 fax machines developed, uh, <laughs> delivered to my office. And as quickly as possible, I tried to put, get all these fax machines to Eastern Europe. This was before 1984. And we thought as long as they're in Eastern Europe, they won't come back. And picking up, of course, is impossible too. So within a year, we managed to do get these 25 machines to Eastern Europe between 87 and 88. So it was before 89. And, and they got to places that later in 89 did have a certain, certain important role to play within the local revolutions there. And some of these fax machines were in Belgrade and in Zagreb with a group that was then called Zeleny Green Circuit. I can't remember the Croatian name at the moment. Zeleny Krug. And in the early 90s, there were some tensions that became apparent. It wasn't, people weren't quite of the same opinion anymore regarding whether Yugoslavia is a good thing. And war was in the air. And one of the things that I learned on the way non-conflict non non, um, or non-violent conflict resolution. And in Zagreb and Belgrade, they thought, well, that's practical, we'll get those people to talk to us. And that's how in the early 90s I came to Zagreb. It was supposed to be for only three months. That was the idea. I was to be there for three months and uh, teach to the police and hospital staff that you have to communicate instead of uh, whacking your brains in. Uh, and. I was sitting there in the hospitals in Osijek and the first grenade came from above and you then think to yourself, well, it didn't quite work. I, I'm not, I don't want to say that it was my fault that the war broke out, but I didn't do my best to stop it. So uh, somehow I was there before I noticed what really was going on. And the first thing those idiots do in Yugoslavia, well, idiots, the different governments that were active, the first thing they do is cut the telephone lines. You couldn't call 
Belgrade from Zagreb anymore, from Sarajevo, with lots of effort you could call Zagreb, but no longer called Belgrade. So all of these different countries were isolated from each other. And the funny thing was, at that time, there was an existing network that was called ARPANET from the universities and all the universities in the whole world were more or less connected to it. And the ARPANET, well, they had, they broke that too. You could only reach each other via detours. And that's the great thing about this network. You could break things, but then messages still found their way. That was the whole idea. When half of that system is destroyed by nuclear bombs, then the messages still find their way from sender to receiver. So, so that works. But most people that were active in the peace movement, in the women's movement, in humanitarian organizations and all that had never heard of computers. No, that was simply not a thing that in the early 90s as a normal activist you were, you dealt with. Even within the Greens there was a huge conflict when one of the Greens took one of these machines into the parliamentary group. You still had the feeling that this is something you should be wary about. They control us. And pretty quickly in Zagreb they found there is a way we can, that we can communicate with Belgrade. We send a fax to the UK and in the UK that was where the central office for the Association for Professional Communication was, the first alternative network worldwide. And these people were then prepared to send that fax on with their machine to Belgrade and vice versa. So if you were quick, it was a, took a few hours and you would get a re reply within a day, which in those days was really fast because the other way was to take the bus from Zagreb to Budapest and from then on to Belgrade and that was a journey that took a whole day. So um, there was another system there, the X25 networks that you could reach if you knew how to do that. And I came to Yugoslavia with the 300 BPS modem. Does anyone know what 300 BPS is? Uh, yeah. Roughly, yeah. If you're lucky, 300 board. You can read quicker than... So, that way you could connect to those X25 networks and actually send messages. Slow. Very slow. You could read it well when... You can follow the com data coming in. You can read it as it came in. You could see it, too. Every bit you could see as it came out there. And, and, and listen in. I don't know. Do pe are there people around that still recognize or remember those noises? I, one day I got it... Got, got to soup that thing up to 9,600. And with that sound, I could communicate with, tele with fax machines on the other side. If you have this many uh, fax machines with all these places in East... Supposedly, hackers can, can uh, make noises with their... Can, can whistle into each other's ears. And that's how they make sex, apparently. Whistle until you until they connect. And so we thought, this isn't working uh, in England. And, and we couldn't get in contact with our friends in Belgrade. And there were these computer networks. There were news groups. You could subscribe to. And one of these news groups was Social Cultural Yugoslavia. And social cultural use Yugoslavia included every so everyone in the world had access to it, and mostly people who had some ancestors that was born in Yugoslavia or something like that. And so I experienced there I experienced something 
nicht kannte. Um, nämlich Krieg, that I had never seen before on the internet, war, completely um, full-formed war, when one, when, when one person would write one thing, someone else would respond that that's not true. And if these days, if you talk about fake news, or... So fake wie die news war, das schafft sogar Trump nicht mehr. Not even Trump achieves the level of fake news that, that they, they were on about back then. It was pretty obvious that somehow if Serbs and Croats, if you try to communicate with them, you need a faster way to communicate. Because not everyone has, has a modem with 300 BPS and not everyone had an X25, knew how an X25 um, network worked and, and knew all these codes, had them, had them memorized. And, and a, an American, Eric Bachmann, in Bielefeld, Bielefeld existed. Um, who in Bielefeld, which by the way exists, or referring to the Bielefeld community, uh, conspiracy, I should look it up on Wikipedia. People that know it existed back, people that know it didn't exist back then. This translator is from Bielefeld. Wow. There's a peace center. And they heard there, there were there were nets, networks that were directly connected to the phone, where you could call each other and then exchange data. And this system was called the Cerberus system. And there were different systems, but Cerberus was a very developed and 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 good working system. And the nice thing about Cerberus is, for the users, there. There is a program where the user could call the system and, and, and download some his information and answer it on his home computer. Eric was was with near us in the Bielefeld area and was involved in the center. And he found that there was such a there was a thing such a thing as mailboxes and mailbox communication. And he just asked us all kinds of questions because Padlun and I, who were with what was then called Furbud, we were operating a network, a mailbox named Bionic, and Eric wanted to know everything. And Eric uh, took care of finding computers, he took care of get, getting people involved and finding the money. You have to imagine that phone calls to the other countries these times were unbelievably expensive. At the time, there was a big difference between local calls and calls across the whole country. Within the same country, there was an eight-minute uh, charging cycle, and it was very expensive. Uh, and if you called abroad, it was way faster. The, the charges came in faster. And calling at different countries was obscenely expensive. And the way around this that we found was Rather than sending a fax to London and back, uh, and then f f from Belgrade via London to Zagreb to automatize this with a mailbox, but still taking a detour because direct phone calls, of course, were not possible anymore, as you've heard. So that's how Bielefeld uh, became the central hub for the Zamit International Network, which was then set up. And we from Bielefeld were calling Zagreb, Belgrade, Ljubljana, Sarajevo, Tuzla, Pristina, and Kosovo, Most, Mostar, uh, Mostar came later. But when I was there, all that was still the future, was still a promise for the future, because when I met Eric the first time in Zagreb, he said, in Germany there is this group that is called Bionic, and they have a system, and that may work. Yeah, he only noticed uh, that it was Furbut, what the name of the group was, to, to reiterate the name. And, and the name Bionic was the mailbox. And because Firbot was such a di difficult name, we renamed us ourselves Digital Courage. Their Digital Courage is our current name. Firbot was the old name, and Bionic was the mailbox. So now we've got that sorted. And, and Eric arrives in Zagreb and tells me all this. There are these people in uh, um, Bielefeld. Bielefeld? <laughs> I actually only know 
Bielefeld because of the um, <laughs> the traffic monitoring that that takes place on the motorway there. Uh, you, you get photographed if you exceed the speed limit. Uh, so you told me about all this, and meanwhile in Zagreb we had found an organization uh, that was the the anti-war campaign. A different women's organizations, environmental organizations, and one foreigner, that was me. And meanwhile, I could understand the local language a bit, and we actually managed to get donations, uh, get a few computers donated to us, and the people in, in Europe or North America thought, uh, come on, we'll send them something good, we'll send them Apple machines. Uh, that was the biggest mistake they could have made, because if you look at an Apple, you can't open it. You really have to have very specific tools, screwdrivers to, to get the damn thing opened. And uh, one apple in Sarajevo means one apple being thrown away because there was simply was no space to get it repaired. Uh, you couldn't connect a modem to it. So long story short, a completely useless thing. But I had an old AT with me. You know what an AT is, right? 386 processor. Okay. Yeah, okay. Did it have a hard disk? It, it, well, it had the, what was the largest hard disk I had bought up to the time, 40, 40 megabyte. He said megabytes. Uh, 20 was the largest and... I was told that I would never in my life have to buy a new hard disk again. That was in 1982. Uh, 1982. But now we're talking about 10 years after, and that network was working on my AT. That was the amazing thing. So it probably won't work on Windows, but it was all DOS in those days. And that became the first node in our network and the idea was to quickly well how should we call this how do we call such a network and we then had the maximal amount of letters that we could give and, and that limit was eight a larger number of letters would simply not fit you couldn't name the files that way anymore and pretty quickly we came up with Zamir, which means for peace. That was very clear. Zamir network and the different hubs that we build simply must be given the names of the cities. So mine became Zamir ZG for Zagreb. And uh, I was there standing next to my bed with this 300 BPS modem, which I was allowed to connect officially, something that was not allowed in Germany. Well, we still did it anyway. So you get those sounds, and that's how it started. We could exchange messages. And Eric then went to Belgrade and found something in the Peace Center there who said, yes, I can operate this. And we have a telephone line too, so that was the biggest problem at the time, at the time to actually have a phone line. Because, I don't know, are people here that were born in the former... East Germany and the, the phone system in Yugoslavia was even worse. So, um, on average, uh, you had three cables for a telephone. So, you had three lines for two telephones and uh, you couldn't make as many phone calls as you would want. And if you put a modem up, that telephone was occupied all the time. So, if someone, if someone annoyed us, we'd simply, they would simply pick up the phone, get it off the hook, and we couldn't get online, couldn't connect, and we couldn't find out where this other person was living as well. And getting a new phone line installed wasn't a hundred German marks, as it was in West Germany at the time, but it was more than a thousand. And it took two years, too. So many was time. And so in Zagreb, we mostly rented houses to get at their phone lines. 
because if you could, well, if you were looking for a house, the first question was, do you have a phone? No, sorry, we won't take that. That was very important. So we had, at certain moments, we had three telephone lines altogether. That was great. That was later, though. The first thing we were confronted with, I said there was this... This youth group called Social Cultural Yugoslavia. And I spent a year living in 89, uh, and so I knew a lot of people. And they told me uh, over the internet, over the ARPANET, that the Orthodox Church uh, in Zagreb was, um, there was an explosion there. there was, and, and, I, and I could see this church every day, and there, was, there were no attacks, no ex explosions there. <laughs> And, and so just like proving online that BFL exists, you can, you can prove that, uh, that there was um, an explosion at a church. And you need to know that Wikipedia wasn't developed to a, a, the point that you could actually find out what really was true. You couldn't send images. You know, I was expecting... I was expecting when I said that uh, Wikipedia tells the truth, I would I would have expected more of a laugh from the audience. I, I'm sorry. So like, either my my jokes are not that good, or the stupidest thing about this is there were people that I knew and they didn't believe that the church was still there. And this church it it, it, it played a, a central role in this whole thing. Because this church was in Zagreb, and, and so the Serbs in Zagreb could say that the Serbs uh, blew up our church. That's Look at these Croatians are fascists and blew up our church. I, I tried to tried to take pictures and, and develop them. So all these digital cameras on phones didn't exist back then either. You had to take a picture first and then have it to be developed. Counterfeiting photos was harder too. You had you had to you had to be able to do it was you had to be skilled for that. So so we got someone organized to, to take a bus from Beograd to arrived in, in Zagreb at our, at our, in our place and took a picture of, of the um, of the church and sent it Beograd. Um, couldn't do that electronically. So that was the first moment when I noticed how important it is, how incredibly important in such situations to fight misinformation, fake information. Because from this fake information, people wanted... They, they wanted to derive the reason for fighting fighting the thing. If we break down break your church, we're gonna our church, we're gonna break your uh, blow up yours. But that's just how people are. In church, church, paying, paying money. A church for a church, a tooth for a tooth. So. Uh, it was you, only with faith you could perhaps see whether there were different nations. Uh, the, well, language, the language was the same, but, but still in Serb cinemas, Croatian movies were subtitled. And, well, that was later. That was the incredible thing that people went to cinema to see how their own languages, how their own language was subtitled in the same language. So, for. One term, you would have a slightly different term, perhaps, but there's these minute differences. And I, as a, a, a Tuchman, the head of state in Croatia, uh, was said to have developed a wholly new Croatian language because somehow he had to state that these were separate people with their own language. So someone in Yugoslavia would say telephone, everyone would understand that. In, in, Croat, it's a different word with the same meaning, which is fast speaker. 
Mm. Yeah, well, long distance table device with um, charge display is a German complicated term for a phone that uh, was around at the time. So, Croatian names were much, much longer. And this was the kind of situation. And uh, well, I thought initially I would be there for three months only. But I, well, human being is a human being, and I fell in love to some extent with the country and, and with a certain person. You just whistled in someone's ears until the carrier connected. Yeah, we connected the very first evening, actually. Connect at first sight. That was not bad. We didn't even whistle. <laughs> I was the new kid on the block to a foreigner computer with him, knew something, <laughs> beautiful foreign man, everything you needed at the time to be to, to stand out. And I was the only foreigner there anyway. At this moment, besides the UN with their white cars, and but they didn't have any contact with the local people and. And, they, and she said at some time, you know, if there really is war and people shoot at you, you really can go home. And then I said the magic words, I would stay in Yugoslavia as long as the war, until the war would be over. And I didn't have to say that in 1990. It took five years and then another three in Kosovo. But I kept my promise. I really stayed there for all that time. And one reason that I'm now speaking to you in Germany is that I was became very tired after five years and took a rest here and then just got stuck. So I was there in Yugoslavia and it was clear that and, and I was part in, in, in the Zami network. network. There wasn't, weren't many people here in Zagreb or Belgrade, and Eric couldn't be anywhere. But these two people were there, and I had a really bad feeling because I had children. A girl and two boys. And somehow, Dad was gone for a very, very long time. And I thought... I will start writing to them what I am doing every day, every single day. And if they would be often, they could still read what dad had been doing there. And that then turned into the Zagreb diary. It was simply meant to tell my children what was happening. But... After three days, something happened, which I wrote about, that had such a lot of influence on the world there, that my diaries were no longer part of my private sphere. There was a, a, a place at the border between Bosnia and Serbia and Croatia, so that was there, that, that triangle. And in Zagreb, we had a fax line with that place. Nobody knows why. But the people that were living in that city wrote to us saying that Serbs had raided the place. So the, the, they were called the White Eagles, they were Chetniks, they went from door to door and the first fax arrived when they were five houses away and with every new fax they were one house closer. And the people on the way were, were just taken from the houses and shot on the street and someone writes that. And we get that. And for Greenet, I published this on the internet in this news group, Social Cultural Yugoslavia. And the first reaction came from the US, from someone who said, Bam, you are exaggerating. 
habe ich auf diesen Moment begriffen, wenn ein Krieg and nicht auf CNN ist, ist es kein it, Krieg. Because it's not on CNN, and at, moment, at that moment I realized, if it's not on CNN, it's not happening, and you just don't believe it. And three days later, CNN wrote, uh, read my report and said, true, and from that point, my diary suddenly was passed on, and more and more people had, had it, and... I don't know. I, I completely. I was completely unaware, and it took a whole year until I realized that my diary had just found a huge audience. And of course, it has to be said. We should say you mistakenly said was on the internet. It's not true. It was in mailboxes. It may have been on Usenet, where it was spread a bit. But the interesting thing was that. For the first time, this was something where the world realized that there is a way of communicating in text communication that was not via telephone. You could write something, send it, and spread it. For us, in fact, the Zamia network was a stroke of luck because the media finally took an interest in our system because we had been building systems that people could use for a long, long time. In Germany, perhaps one million were using Cerberus, CL, and other networks, and no medium ever took an interest. But now, there were there was this this one this huge networking effect that Eric Bachmann in in ex Yugoslavia had built with Bam together and. Just this whole UN embargoes to to subvert these and subvert the embargoes, get computers smuggled in transport planes. I think some, uh, I think you were a UN employee, Eric was, uh, formerly. I was the one that had an official contract with the UN, so that was a way of, of getting low-tech communication established. Uh, as you said, the 286 processor, uh, you could compare that with the computing capacity of uh, perhaps the C64. That's the thing you worked with. And with one telephone line that wasn't multiplexed, only one data stream could go through there from A to B. With that, you communicated, and then it was spread. And then in some mailboxes like ours, there were some journalists who received that as a so-called point, people that downloaded the data and read it, and then uh, others took that and, and printed it, and so that was before the internet existed. We're talking 92, 93, 94, when it slowly started. But before all that started with the internet, there was a sense in the public that these networks are useful for something. These are not just technical idiots that are playing games and and look at naked girls and 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 rob and pirate software. But that was actually not what was on our networks. That was only text, no pornographic stories, um, political things, political groups using them, and networking, APC, Greennet, and all Antifa groups were using these networks. There was some real serious work being done. This was an interesting network, and the internet actually destroyed all this, but that's a different story. That should be told in a different place. But that was the interesting thing, and your diaries, that, that was a content that people could look at. It was interestingly written. Well, you were there in Zagreb. You, you were uh, at, in the refugee camps. You, you saw the w, uh, VW buses and people looking for their families, and, and they could then use those computers to find these. That was a genius uh, piece of work, but uh, that diary to, to, to write about this, to, this experience, is that didn't just tell people that there is a war going on, but that people live and laugh in the war, and there are fantastic stories from Sarajevo, even under attack. That competition, will I make it across the street without getting hit? People really playing those games to just find, uh, to, to get a sense of that. That showed the people in the whole world what all this new data network could could be, and, the, and that was a very really different aspect beyond war and the people in Yugoslavia. You were traveling there, you, you got to know people. That were, when we heard that you came from Bionic, people were in tears and thanking you for bringing their families together as, as a figurehead. So that's the one story. But the other story is that it helped the world to help Google 
helped Microsoft. Uh, that's what we're fighting these days because we want our own structures. We want to. We don't have the networks. We don't have control of the networks anymore because we forgot how important it is to have your own structures with low-tech computers, with modems, with just one telephone line, with deliberating how you can use donated satellite lines, decentralized working. These days, we are no longer working in a decentralized way. We are depending on one switch that someone can switch and, and switch off. And that's another story that has to be told in this context. Ihr hört, Sie waren beide ziemlich damit beschäftigt. Um, you guys are quite busy with that. I didn't even kn know them. I, I only knew them over the internet. I, I actually saw them for the first time about 20 years ago. You, you gave a talk in Berlin, that's when I saw you the first time. Once in, in my diary, I got a, a, an email out of the blue from an address I didn't um, recognize at all. And, and w one of them I recognized sounded familiar, whitehouse.gov. And, and the guy who wrote it was called A.Gore. And in this, at this moment, I had no idea, had no clue that this was the vice president of the U.S. And so I'm sitting there in Croatia and doing my thing. Oh, he's saying, you're sitting there in Croatia doing your thing. Do you need anything? And, of course, plenty of normal people ask me that question. And I asked for, like, a few things, like diskettes. But al.gore at whitehouse.gov, I... I kind of felt like I could, that could get interesting. In peace. And you, you, you come into contact with people that you would have never come into contact with. And I, I, I really got... I, I, it was pretty obvious to me that I could just write whatever I wanted. It's not a lot you can break in a in a war torn country, anyways. Everything's already broken, anyways. If you walk around Syria, but back then, all half the buildings were were broken, anyway. So there wasn't a lot you could break. And I wrote I wrote some stuff like imagine. In this world, there's a lot of factories that produce lots lots of crap and they have this con con crisis of conscience in Sarajevo we have about 40,000 people and every day they need dialysis there's no dialysis liquid and 70,000 Lot, all these people need dialysis. I, I can Im imagine to, to have their uh, to have their consciences settled a bit. They could donate a little bit of the dialysis fluid. And at the same time, I thought there's lots of mostly American, mostly American uh, helicopter pilots that had done things in Vietnam of which after which they still couldn't sleep and so there's a way here here there's a way to come to Bosnia to Croatia and and to do good stuff with your flight we just needed a helicopter 20 more minutes we just need a helicopter and so of course we thought never never the next day on Fort Plasmo, that's the the air base next to Zagreb, three big pharmaceutical industries sent medicines, not just dials, of fluid, and we had um, 36 uh, helicopter pilots within three days and two helicopters, and there is applause all around. In, in this moment, it seems like it works. We can do this stuff. And so, so I wrote, there's all these people here. 
in refugee camps. All these, all these kids have been sitting in refugee camps for months, and nobody does anything for them. The UN gives them food, a tent, and medical care, but they're sitting there for months without anything to do. And I went by UNICEF and asked, can I play with kids in refugee camps? They, they called me and said, of course you can play with kids in refugee camps. Can, can I invite my friends to play with kids in refugee camps? And they're like, sure, but they'll never come. And, and a, there in the, the, the border to Slovenia, there is a... Uh, there is a train on its on its way to Germany. Um, Six hundred people going to Germany, and and went to Germany and it, and was sent back. Eight thousand people came. Eight thousand people were ready to to pay their flight to spend a number of weeks in, in the refugee camps to play with the kids. And, and these days we, we know, we realize that that was a good thing that we did back then, that we brought kids into contact with culture from the whole world. That we said very consciously, we don't want people we don't want people from, from one country. We want people from lots of different countries all together. That's what I wrote in my diary. That's the most important thing. We were the first people in the world that, that had refugee camps with internet connections. You, can you imagine? And there were really internet connections because in this moment, CERN um, was just getting started and they wanted something that came every day. Actually, I prefer that we use the last 15 minutes for questions from the audience. And mainly, I have a question to the audience. And would you please show up who of you uh, is actually from one of the former Yugoslav countries? That uh, There are a few. Uh, have any of you ever used Z the Zamia network or are you all too young for that? Okay, I can't see any hands. Okay, great. Uh, so I would like to ask our Harold to <clears throat> get the microphones organized and take the questions. Okay, I think I'll speak for everyone. To, if, to when I thank um, very warmly for his witness report. <clears throat> we have four microphones in the room, two in the middle row, two, one left, one right, you can line up there. Please uh, hold back with expressions of gratitude. We want to get some questions through. And does our signal ha angel have a question from the internet? No question from the internet, so microphone one, please. Ah, is this off? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, Vam, we have Vam. Today uh, we have refugee camps back in Germany. We have people that engage, and uh, we have people giving them internet connections via Freifunk. Do you have any experience having worked in a similar way? Uh, do you have any advice? What is important? What you can do? This next to getting the routers to run. No. Internet and the internet, phones are the most important things a refugee has. It's his street number, it's his house, it's the way to reach them. The first thing that we we did in the city, something like Bad Belzig, the city I live in, it's somewhere between here and Berlin. The first thing we did in, in 1996 uh, in, in this refugee home was, a ref, was an internet connection and I... And communication is a matter of life for people. In, in, in I think it was... Communication is so important that people stay in connection with their home country. And then I say about the internet. It's a very brief anecdote, uh, just five minutes. <laughs> imagine, imagine. Pristina lives in Kosovo. 
Because, you know, most people are Muslim. People, pe people like men can go out and, and women have to stay at home. And the men go out to coffee shops every evening and we had two women that we called the electronic witches and they went out with little laptops and taught the women in, in the homes how to get into the internet and those were ladies that didn't even know the computers existed they, they never they never they never had a typewriter and and so they learned their their typing and writing on computers and were in touch with people in America and Australia and the thing that we achieved was women in, in Brasina um, in contact with the whole world and then men sat while while men sat in coffee shops talking about the world empowering empowering is the most important word in this whole thing give people give people opportunities to do things it's not about it's it's not just about the technology it's about the technology that's been put into practice we can have the nicest handies in the world but if we don't use them for something that actually is meaningful then it's just 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 a, a pure um environmental all right, then I'll tell an anecdote as well, because I ran workshops for women from all parts of the, that country, and I got to know women that were in the Free Bosnian Army and fought there, and that had built up the Center for Raped Women in Zenica and with donated computers, they, they turned donated broken computers into functioning computers, and even in Zagreb, also in Zagreb, there were women that were engaged in that system, and that then was discussed in Parliament in Croatia, and they were said, these are all Serbian communists that run these mailboxes. Serbian communists, and you are under underestimating them because they are women. They are dangerous. You have to imagine when you look, watch TV and, and you see your own portrait and, and that of your girlfriend and another friend and, they, and under that it says a good Croat knows what he sh or she should do with those people. Yeah, well, we're getting close to that in Germany too. Maybe one hint for those that have just come in because they were expecting more info on technology. We didn't really have to do that because we have had a talk on that before about the mailbox technology, different technologies that were there at the time. And I watched that talk just now before this and it really shows you all the details with their protocols and all that, how the whole thing worked. So I don't think we have to do that here now. And talk about the thing, the, the question how it was used. I, of course, could add another anecdote uh, because mailboxes in Germany were an interesting thing too and the Interior Secret Service was building up mailbox networks. There was the Spinnennetz, the left radical network and the Thule network, a right wing radical network and the, the Thule network had, uh, it contained a bomb making instruction manual uh, of course, in a secret area that you couldn't openly, uh, you couldn't just enter the open uh, area, didn't have much, but the, the private part had this instruction manual, but that was written by someone that was a system admin with us, Bionic, in Bielefeld. Uh, I don't want to add that this same guy is, is, still, is now organizing big hacker congresses, but he was there in school, interested in chemistry and he had this one board that w contained info on pyrotechnology, uh, those that wanted to experiment with explosive. Uh, um, well, I tried it, it the, the results were dismal, uh, because I would have liked to have information, but the young people there did chemical hacking, they met at a nice camp. Uh, I, oh, I'm getting reminded I have to keep it short, and this bomb-making manual led to a a house being searched under strange circumstances. Uh, the subject line had been the, the little terrorist, and uh, at two o'clock, 
Um, As we had indicated with our opening times at the door, there was a policeman at our door, and he had been charged by the uh, prosecutor to take all the computers, which wouldn't have been wouldn't have been great. So I said, "Okay, well, look here. I have to press uh, uh, ID, and that would give you bad press." And and the uh, head of the police crew said, okay, I'm not interested in bad press. And I replied, okay, that's good. You, It would be bad if you cared about bad press, but we have uh, help convoys being organized through our networks. And if you read that the people had died in Sarajevo because the help convoys hadn't arrived, then you would have a bad conscience, wouldn't you? And that got him thinking. And he, support, uh, he got on the phone and fought with the prosecutor saying, saying that he would not want to take any of the computers. So that system actually protected us. So. Right. And we have a... Oh, just one more anecdote. And uh, two months later, the, the phone rings. And hello, this is the State Protection Agency at Bielefeld. My son needs to do a, an internship. Can I do it at your place? Oh, hey, hold up. I told him, you, you know that your, your colleague was here a few months ago for a, a raid... Uh, for a um, to search for the place, okay, and, and they were so enthusiastic about the place. That's why I'm calling you now. How was the frequency of what was the frequency of messages in the Zami network? And next to your diaries, what else was being? What, what could you read there? We we have learned that cat videos didn't exist. Uh, well, we had about 1,200 users in Sarajevo, uh, 600 in uh, Serbia, and a number in, in Croatia, in Kosovo, and 400 and, and Slovenia. Uh, that was the users in the country. On average, that was a higher number of users than in Germany at the time. More people in Croatia were using computers for data communication than in Germany. I actually doubt that. Um, anyway, it was about 20 to 30 megabytes per day that we distributed. A lot of mail and sometimes I was sitting in the basement there looking at the computers and every bit that went to Sarajevo I could see because uh, for a while, our system was always getting stuck and we couldn't find what was the problem. And somewhere in America, at the university, someone could order, for, order games and these were then transmitted in blocks to someone over the network, to, to, to people that ordered in, in blocks which were put into emails. And someone in Sarajevo had ordered Doom. Doom! in the middle of war, where there was enough of that happening. I saw that later in Sarajevo, someone was playing Doom on the computer, and on that computer screen, you could see the same building that was on the other side of the road. So we could, it was just text that we were communicating with, and it's still, I still, I'm a text only guy. Are there any more questions? I can't see anyone. Anything from the internet? Signal angels? Shakes his head. So we have three more minutes for a closing joke. So Sarajevo, the, the ma mailbox stopped working often around noon, and a woman who worked on the systems tried to figure it out and, and follow the cable and and discovered that in in the basement another person living there the janitor s s turned on an oven to heat up his his food and and the power went out and so then we, we realized and so from its we needed some extra plugs yeah our mailbox was was in the post office of Sarajevo. And to end on this post office, an, an inscription. Here is 
Idiot, this is the post. This is pro Serbia, and someone had added, Idiot, this is the post office. The graffiti on the wall or something. So maybe for us to learn something, so, we, so that we can learn something for future wars that may come. We at some point had a phone call from someone who somehow within the secret services and had been in radio communications and now retired and that's what he said and he gave us a good tip because he said what you're doing there in ex-Yugoslavia is very dangerous, it can actually under martial law regard, be regarded as espionage. Soldiers could come and get you out and shoot you on the spot without any legal procedure. So, this is the tip. Don't do it in secret. Do it in the open. Write on your walls in large letters what you do post notices, show what you do and do just that because that protects you. And another thing, never communicate in encryption because that uh, will make you much more prone to being accused of espionage. And that's why we wrote, because that's why we had this feature in, in our Z-Connect protocols that asked for non-encrypted responses for areas at war. This is very, very important. Don't always think, ah, this is a war, we have to send them an encrypted message. No, the exact opposite. Just think a bit further and just look at military intelligence. And, and until then, we should take care to not have a war and use encrypted communication for that. Hit the spot at the time, please, another thank you to Wang, Rena and Padlun. And